An ancient prophet who found himself in despair may just have the answers for your 21st century worries. Father Leonard Andre on the magnificent story of Elijah now. My name is Todd Warner, and this is the Evangelization and Culture Podcast from Word on Fire. Father Leonard Andre is the pastor of the thriving Church of St. Therese in Deep Haven, Minnesota. Obtaining a degree in finance from the University of Notre Dame, Father Andre worked in finance for several years before returning for a master's in education at the College of William and Mary. After teaching elementary school and high school math and science, he discerned his vocation to the priesthood, leading him from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. to the St. Paul Seminary in Minnesota. Ordained in 2013, he has worn many hats, including parochial vicar, high school chaplain, and now parish priest at St. Therese. His love for Christ and his mission is infectious. Segment one, meeting Father Andre. Father, a wise man once wrote, quote, each of us writes the narrative of our own lives by the choices we make. These choices are informed by our beliefs about our origin, identity, and destiny, end quote. That wise man, of course, was Father Leonard Andre. So Father, first of all, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you here. No, it's great to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. You bet. I love this notion that our choices are informed by our beliefs about our origin, identity, and destiny. So, Father, I'm going to start with a really an easy one. What do you believe about your origin, your identity, and your destiny? Well, you know, it's certainly a, a great consolation to know that I've been created. We've been created by a loving God who takes care of us and who loves us, and we are created out of love. You know, in, in some sense, we are an overflow of love. The very fact that we exist, that superabundance of God's love. Um, I think about the way he looks at us at every moment of our lives with just tremendous affection and love and uh, wills the best for us at all at all moments, right? Our total well-being. And the fact that he holds us uh, in being at every moment uh, with his love and then has a plan or a vocation for each one of us that is uniquely tailored uh, for each one of us. And so if you think about this, uh, Dr. Todd, is um, from all eternity, the Lord has these graces that he wants to give to us and only to us uniquely uh, based on our personality and the way he's created us for uh, a specific purpose, purpose of glorifying him and uh, for uh, building his church, uh, which is the presence of Christ uh, on earth today. Uh, as well as our own happiness, right? Our subjective happiness uh, that we all want instinctively. So uh, the fact that he has this vocation and plan for each one of us, I find to be exciting and a great mm -hmm. adventure for us. And I know that my life is not about me, but it's rather about uh, Christ, who is the very face of love and the very um, imprint of, of the Father's love for us, you know? So to look at the world that way, uh, life really becomes an adventure with Christ. Uh, to know that we're created out of love, held in being by love, and really meant for love. Our destiny is to be in communion with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who is eternal love for us. Uh, a very different way of looking at the world than a secular mindset. Right. I sort of create my own narrative. I carve my own path. You know, here in Minnesota, we plow our own snow, you know, sort of our own path. Uh, that's just the weight that we're, that you put upon yourself uh, that I think is unnecessary. Uh, rather than looking at the world and saying, the Lord has a path for me, and uh, the more I discover that path that he has for me, the happier I will be, and uh, actually the more I will bring joy to other people around me as well. That's fantastic. And by the way, I, 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 was, I, I kind of tease a little bit because I know you're going to hit this question out of the park and I say this is an easy one. I know that's a difficult question to answer and it was just, thank you for those, that, those very thoughtful words. And, and, and I, always, I will say in my years of knowing you, Father, um, your ability to, to really highlight um, that profoundly intimate relationship we have with Christ, that profound investment God has, has in us as individuals, which does run counter to a more utilitarian, appetite-driven, secular narrative. Um, you just, you, what you just said is just, it, again, it embodies very much what I've known about you, which is reclaim that, that intimate relationship with Christ um, and, and don't qu quite believe the secular narrative that you should be driven by your appetites, driven by ideologies, 
um, uh, uh, driven by um, anti-religious uh, uh, aspects that are out there. So thank you for that. And, and thank you for letting me ask you a, what, I th what I think is a tough question and, and just hitting out of the park. I want to talk to you a little bit about you and your background. Um, and, and again, you, you, you mentioned about choices that are informed by our beliefs about our origin, identity, and destiny. So I'm going to talk about some of the choices that have led you to where you are today. So first, how does a Minnesota kid studying finance at Notre Dame finding himself teaching elementary and high school kids in Virginia. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, your background and that journey from, from one place to the other? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things I try to relate to my parishioners is just the fact that I'm a priest. Uh, in some sense, should give you hope because when I share my background, people go, holy cow. Yeah. Um, so I uh, come from a, a separated uh, a family. Uh, my parents separated when I was five years old. Um, I love both my parents uh, to death. Um, they're very good parents uh, and good to us. Uh, but we were not really, I was not really raised in a religious uh, household. Mm. Uh, so we didn't have uh, any, any background in terms of faith uh, at all. In fact, I didn't even know the difference uh, between a Protestant and a Catholic uh, until my junior year of college, sure. of all things, right? So I had somebody explain this to me. And so naturally, without um, some type of moral framework or um, some type of vision, uh, a Christian vision, like a lot of kids today, I got into trouble, um, uh, you know, dabbling in drugs and uh, over drinking and partying and, and, and things of like this in, in high school. Uh, I always had a personality, though, the good little sense of humor that always came through. I was voted <laughs> class clown in <laughs> high school. So my uh, high school classmates to this day just cannot believe that I'm a priest so, <laughs> on Facebook. They're like, you've got to be kidding me. How does this happen? Uh, we need some but, witty people in the church. So that's good. Right. That yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, is, went to actually St. Thomas for a couple of years and then transferred to Notre Dame because I knew I had to get away from my mm -hmm. high school friends and mm -hmm. I just couldn't break that sort of bad habits that I had formed. And I made this little prayer to the good Lord. Um, even though I didn't really have a relationship with God at all at the time, I said, if you can get me to Notre Dame, I will, um, I will go to mass and I'm not going to say I'm going to like it, but I'll go mm, to mass. Mm. Don't ask me where they came from. Just inspired by the Holy spirit sort of unknowingly, uh, at the time. And I, and I got into Notre Dame and I was like, well, I'm going to be a man of my word. Right. And yeah. so I went to mass and I have to be honest, I was there in body, but not in spirit sure. at all. I mean, I can't even hardly remember being at mass at Notre Dame. That's how bad it was. Yeah. So after Notre Dame, uh, I had a friend who invited me to a Bible study, a non-denominational Bible study. And the only reason he went to the Bible study is because his parents basically forced him to and said, I'm not, we're not going to pay for your car insurance if you don't go to this you know, thing. So he wanted mm -hmm. to drag me along with him uh, to this thing. So I went and uh, knowing nothing about uh, sacred scripture, knowing really nothing about the Christian faith, uh, started to learn and uh, was introduced to Christ uh, for the first time, really, and the beauty of Christ and a, a deep love for sacred scripture as well. Uh, and then naturally some questions started to come up about, well, I'm a baptized Catholic and what does that mean? And uh, I had a wonderful uh, Catholic family. They were uh, family friends of ours that saw these changes uh, taking place and, and they were very interested, of course. Mm. And so they invited me over to their house and uh, shared with me the more fullness of the faith in terms of the sacramental life and a little bit of the long history of the church and shared some Scott Hunt books uh, with me, uh, which I read. And that just opened up, it was like layers of an onion just kind of uh, unpeeling uh, before my eyes. Wow. I got a hold of the vocations director, not that I wanted to be a priest, but I had all kinds of questions about the Catholic faith and, and, and uh, what does it mean to be Catholic. I went out and purchased the Catholic catechism and literally read it from cover to cover on my own, wow. on my breaks at work. And for me, for whatever reason, don't ask me why, it always just kind of made sense as I was reading. I'm like, this is kind of what I've been hungering for mm. in my life. Tracked down the archbishop at the time was Archbishop Harry Flynn. I uh, shared my story with him. I was so nervous to meet him because I <laughs> missed confirmation. Sure. And I said, you know, I want to be confirmed. I shared my story with him. And I'll never forget uh, the words that he shared with me. He said, you know, Lenny, we're going to kill the fatted calf. You're you're coming home. Wow. And I, was, I was moved to tears. Oh, uh, my. A pastoral heart. My goodness. Wow. It reminds me to have a great uh, pastoral heart uh, as well. 
And uh, so it was confirmed and then um, was in that Bible study a second year. And uh, somehow the topic of, of confession came up. And this is not mm. a Catholic thing. And I found myself defending confession and why it's important that we go to a priest and to bring our sins to Christ uh, through uh, in the instrumental cause of the priest. And uh, they all sat and looked at me and they said, <laughs> hey, we actually believe that's a really good. Oh, gr great. And they said, great. And one guy just said to me, okay, what's it like? And I felt myself, uh, the redness in my face and the embarrassment. And I said, you know, I haven't been to confession since my first confession wow. uh, in second grade. And so I'm, this is after college now. And he said, so you mean to tell me you know all about confession and you never go? And the Lord spoke through that gentleman to wow. me. You have got, I have got to go. Mm. I have got to go. And so I thought, I'm not going to go to my parish priest. I can tell you that much right now. Uh, so I got in my car and I drove down to the cathedral to St. Paul. And uh, I remember standing in line. Every time I go to the cathedral, I still look at that same confessional where the Lord touched me deeply. Mm. And as I got closer and closer and that you know red light turns to green light, I walked in the confessional. I was shaking. I was mm. so nervous. Mm. And I said to the priest, I have no idea what to do. You got to help mm. me. I haven't been to confession since my first confession. And oh my goodness, the Lord gave me such a beautiful priest. He was yeah. so kind. He said, let's just take a moment to thank God that you're here. Uh, we were, we're thanking God that you responded to the Holy Spirit and to grace. Let's think of some of the bigger things of your life that you want to get off your chest and your heart. And let's bring them to Jesus and that he can forgive them. He just walked me through, you know, like a loving father through that sacrament. Gave me a little penance to do. And uh, I did my penance. And I'll tell you, I got in my car. And I don't know if you ever had this in your life, when you can feel a huge cry that's about to happen, yeah. a cry of relief, yeah. a cry of just saying it's going to be okay, and a cry of joy and a gratitude. And I was on the bridge uh, leaving St. Paul, going back to a suburb, uh, you know, my home, and I cried and cried. Oh, wow. and I was so grateful wow. to our Lord for his mercy for me and being patient with me and giving me a second a second chance, kind of like uh, we'll talk about here a little bit with Elijah, give him a second chance or Jonah, you know. Uh, and so then from there, it was a period of about four or five years of really wrestling uh, with the Lord and getting accustomed to what does it mean to be Catholic, going to adoration, going to daily mass, meeting Catholic friends, and then wrestling with um, what I would call a little gnat. Uh, you know, the Lord's voice comes to me at least very softly, very gently, um, right at the core of my heart. And uh, I, and then um, sometimes I'll shoo it away, but then mm. it will come back. And then yeah. I'll say, oh, I'm scared. And he'll address that fear. And then it'll come back again. So it's like this kind of real, kind of real gentle um, floppings of, of a bird's wings or something that will sure. kind of continue to come close to me. And for me, the telltale sign was it's consistent. It, yeah. it kept coming and it was soft. It was encouraging. It would melt away my fears. I'd come up with excuses like Moses at the burning bush. And he'd say, those are not, you know, uh, let's let's talk about those. And so one by one, he would just kind of deal with all my uh, concerns and fears. And he would just say, just take the next step. Just mm. take the next step. I'm not asking you, I'm not revealing all of the future for you. Just take one step forward. And then we'll take another step forward. Then we'll take another step forward and take another step forward. So, you know, the lengthy application process, the psychological testing, the interviewing, uh, by the God's grace, I made it through it all. And then I have to tell you, you know, those first year or two of seminary, I just kept saying to myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know, what am I doing here? Like of all the people, seriously, why have you called me to do this? Yeah. Um, I'm happy. I'm grateful. But it's in awe, you know, that he called me to do that. Yeah. Uh, and let me just close with this is. You know, at my ordination, I, you know, some friends from out of town from Notre Dame came. And I'll never forget my aunt uh, said in front of everybody to my friend Liam. He said, did you ever think that Lenny would become a priest? And he goes, are you kidding me? He's the last person <laughs> we, that we thought would probably, probably be a priest. It's just a miracle that he's a priest. And I've been a priest now for it's my 10th year, my 10th anniversary of May 25th. Oh, congratulations. Uh, you know, and uh, I'm just extremely uh, grateful uh, to be a priest and to take care of God's people, I, I could not ask for anything more, you know more from the Lord. He's just so kind to me and so good to me. It's just a beautiful life. A you beautiful know what, what's interesting about your story? Uh, there's a, it's a wonder, and I just I'm in awe 
of the story and the the hand of God and the call of God kind of threading throughout it, which is which is just fantastic. First of all, you know, isn't it always the case or seemingly always the case? And we're going to we'll talk about Elijah in a little bit, but the the most people who consider themselves the most unlikely figures, you know, whether it's St. Peter or St. Paul or Mary or or I'm sure Elijah or Moses, the most the, 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 it seems like when someone hears the call or has that gnat coming and just kind of circles around and, and so on, and you take it one step at a time or or you're knocked off your horse and you're transformed in a minute, um, it seems like the narrative over and over again is, I, I, I never thought this would happen to me or it, or in the eyes of the world, this is the most unlikely person that would do this. And so it's an extraordinary it's an extraordinary testimony to the need to trust in providence as opposed to human designs, you know, oh, well, we have all these people that have been groomed to get to this point and therefore they're the natural choice. And then God comes along and knocks that plan down and, and says, actually, I've got another idea. The, the, the second thing I want to throw out is um, your, the way you described um, walking out of that confessional. You know, when I, when I first went through my, my very first confession as an adult, I converted in 2010, um, I was at the same confession that uh, uh, one of my daughters was, was for her um, first, holy con, uh, first, first uh, reconciliation. And I remember walking out of that moment and feeling like I could walk on air. And one of my good friends, who was a director of religious education at our, at our uh, parish at that time, looked at me with a big smile on his face and a, and a twinkle in his eyes. And he said, look at you with your lily white soul. And, and, and that whole notion of, uh, um, as Chesterton said, you know, not living in the morbidity of your sin, but effectively being freed from it. Um, was so extraordinary. And I was like you, the sense I had read a lot about confession, never did it. Uh, I confessed to God personally, but I'd never been before a, a priest and doing that. And I could just say, uh, similarly, it was extraordinary. So I really appreciate what you're describing. And I hope a lot of our listeners also have a certain uh, memory of a confession or all confessions that have that, that, sort, of, uh, that sort of a narrative in their own life. Yeah, one story to share with you here, just uh, as a confession, I'll, uh, I'll never forget. Obviously, I'm not going to share the details with you, the, the seal, but uh, I was at a Steubenville uh, conference. Uh, we were in Rhode Island, and this is one of these big, huge uh, sort of, um, you know, basketball arenas, and, and there's just tons of high schoolers and, and young people uh, coming to confession. And there was a young uh, lady uh, was coming, uh, came to me, and I could see the heaviness on her face, just all that she had been through. And I thought, my goodness. And she uh, then, you know, and Father, Son, Holy Spirit uh, started proceeding with her confession. And in the middle of her confession, she stops. She looks at me and she starts crying mm. like I hadn't seen somebody cry like before. I mean, it was just coming out of her. Mm. Like a, and I just I, I didn't say I just let her go, like give her the freedom and the space that she needed to do that. And then she cleaned up her face and then she looked at me and she said, thank you. I needed that. Wow. And I, I just, I was like, wow. So she, she, you know, finished her confession. I gave her absolution. And I, for me personally, I will never forget the way she walked away from mm. the There was like, she was barely touching the ground with her shoes. Wow. Wow. She was so light, so joyful, so relieved that Christ had encountered her in this very loving and tender way. And it was giving her another chance to be the person that she really is at the end of the day, right? She's a daughter of God. Yeah. And I thought, my goodness, Lord, you have used me just as a little old instrument here for this particular person whom I will never see again, likely in all my life, right? But we had that beautiful encounter with Christ that happened right there. But I think about that. Thank you. I needed that. And how we all really deep down need that, right? That touch of Christ and the forgiveness of Christ and the tenderness of Christ and to encounter him, right? So that we say, thank you, Jesus. We need you and we need your forgiveness and we need to experience your mercy and your kindness uh, to us to give us another chance. Amen. Well said, Father. And I hope that people listening, I, I imagine that a lot of people, including myself, we feel a little bit, as we talk about this, we feel uh, the weight of uh, unconfessed sins kind of on our shoulders and, and to know that um, that way can be lifted from a, a mere uh, short drive away uh, to your local parish and to engage in that act of reconciliation confession with a, a priest is a extraordinary um, spiritual miracle uh, that's available to us and is, is asked of us. But I think we want it when we hear it. Um, sometimes we fight it, but, but uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful reminder. 
Yeah, we fight it on the surface, but deep down we actually want it. Right. Segment two, the problem of suffering. Flannery O'Connor once insisted, quote, what people don't realize is how much religion costs. They think faith is a big electric blanket, when of course it is the cross. It is much harder to believe than not to believe, end quote. Um, Father, in exploring your history, um, I omitted some moments of suffering in your life and the life of your family. I, I, I came across a story, uh, and we've talked, I think, a little bit at one point in passing, but I was able to delve a little bit deeper into it. Tell, me, tell us a little bit about your grandfather, uh, Leonard Werner. So my grandfather uh, is a very, very uh, special man. Uh, he uh, was the mayor of a little town, and uh, whenever his name uh, seems to be mentioned, at least my family members, they all light up with a kindness, a sense of humor that he had. And my grandfather was diagnosed with polio uh, when he was about 21 years old or so. So you can imagine back in those days with my grandmother and this huge change of, of life that right. was coming forth. But he never let that suffering, um, it never turned him inward uh, or downward. So sometimes we can go inward and downward uh, with our suffering. But rather, he said, OK, this is this is what the Lord in his permissive will uh, has for me. So I'm going to still stay outward uh, in terms of my uh, uh, generosity towards others and sharing my talents and then stay upward mm. uh, towards the Lord uh, as well. So he uh, was going to be a farmer, uh, but because of polio, obviously, he couldn't do that. So he uh, went back to school a little bit, learned uh, the trade of, um, of accounting, was accountant, a very you know established accountant. But then with his one good arm that he had, uh, when the local little parish needed an altar to build, uh, my grandfather uh, in his basement uh, built that altar with polio in his wheelchair wow. for the parish uh, and did anything that the priest needed or asked of him in a very quiet and humble way without any fanfare whatsoever. Uh, he was 46 uh, years old, which I just turned 46 uh, just uh, not that long ago. Actually. Wow. And um, he went in for a surgery and uh, there were some complications. Uh, too much anesthesia was uh, given to him and he never uh, woke up oh. from it. And the, the thing that's really kind of interesting with divine providence is I was born on a Sunday evening uh, and he uh, died uh, the next morning. So my poor mother, mm. uh, first born son on a, on a Sunday evening and then her dad dies the very next morning. And my family uh, went to go, to go tell him that he had a firstborn son. He was in a coma. Mm. And they said, you know, Leonard, you have a, a new uh, baby boy, a grandbaby boy here, firstborn son. And my grandma would always get choked up. She said, I am not making this up. She said, when we told that to him, one tear oh, wow. came out of his eye uh, just before he passed. Wow. They say that hearing is the last uh, thing to go you sure. know, when, you're, when you're suffering. Uh, and so fast forward all these years, my grandpa is you know, likely praying for me uh, from the kingdom of heaven, the communion of mm -hmm. saints. Uh, I'm or, uh, ordained a priest. And where do I celebrate my first mass is I go back to that little town and I celebrate mass on that altar that my grandfather uh, built who died the day after I was born. So Story, right? my mother there in the front pew. We have my whole family, you know, bringing up the gifts just in awe. Mm at God and what God has done for our family and how this full circle comes around with this grandchild celebrating uh, this mass on this altar who was born the day before he passed away. You can't make this stuff. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary story and you, and you just, this, it, these are the narratives of God and it's, it's an extraordinary story. This is, if, if I'm not mistaken, can I say, is it Coates, St. Agatha and Coates? Yeah, is that yeah, correct? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. It's, and that, and that altar is still stands to this day, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, is that right? Absolutely. absolutely. Are you, are you ever, have you been back or, 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 or I suppose it's not easy because of how busy your schedule is and so on. Um, or, or was that kind of that, premier uh kind of inaugural episode of your first mass uh practiced i've been back at a couple of times since my mass of thanksgiving uh and every time of course there's sort of a lot of sentimental yeah. value there going back with my family i've celebrated a funeral there and uh, helped them with the sunday mass one time but not too often i get back there but uh you know you always wonder like retirement if priests ever retire like if that would be like a little parish that i could take care of or something you know yeah but you know we'll see what the good lord has in store extraordinary extraordinary i also love what you said about outward and upward um you know there's something about and we'll get into the notion of suffering and the problem of suffering but 
to have your, I mean, when you said he died at 46, I mean, he was afflicted by, by polio. How much, how much earlier, do you remember what age he was when he was first diagnosed with polio? Uh, 21. So, so here he is a 21 year old, a, a strapping lad and he's afflicted with something that's life changing. And he finds, I'm sure he, there was grieving and, and, and I'm sure, sure, sure very dark moments, but the notion that he would, with whatever strength he had inside of him, adopt a, a devotional attitude of, of, of not turning inward and going downward, but uh, going outward and upward in terms of his attitude, his contributions, his faith. Um, it's again, it's a, it's a, it's an extraordinary story of, of um, recovery in the face of profound suffering. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other uh, deeply impactful for me in terms of suffering was my dad. Uh, so my dad uh, was a man who was not a man of many words. I'll tell you that much right now. How was your day, dad? It was good. Okay. How, how was the chicken? That's good. Okay, so dad, we gotta try to have a conversation. Here. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, but he was a, a mechanic on tractor trailers, semi tractor trailers. I'd fallen away from his faith. Um, oh my goodness, was never it was never uh, no hostility towards the faith, but just had sort of fallen away from the faith. And uh, he he started to complain uh, in his mid to late fifties. Uh, he said, you know, what? my my um, my right arm, I I just can't lift up a newspaper very well anymore. And I'm having trouble typing at work. Mm. Uh, he said, I don't know what's going on here. So he went to the doctor and they did a bunch of testing uh, from my father and uh, they came back uh, and they said, we have some you know, very difficult news for you here. You have uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's oh disease. And uh, my dad was like, you gotta be kidding me. And so my dad was 56 uh, years old. And so he dropped that bomb on me in, in 2006 and I've been thinking about the seminary. And every time I would go and see my dad, obviously I would see a regression in his uh, health, right? Sure. So he could only use one arm, then both arms, and then he was he had to use a walker. And my dad was a very stubborn guy and kind mm. of a Bible guy. So this humbled him uh, tremendously. And I remember him, he would have to look at the floor because, um, you know, as they continue to take, uh, it was like a, a candle of melting wax. His body was kind of melting wax candle. Mm. And at the end, he could only move his eyes. That's mm. it. He couldn't speak anymore. Mm. Um, uh, tremendous, tremendous suffering, uh, you know, bed sores, uh, things of that nature. But I remember one time we were watching like the Twins game. We like to watch the Twins game together. And I said, Dad, you know, how are you handling all this? It was kind of a father to son sort of moment. And yeah. he just, you know, and it, it is what it is. You know, he wasn't angry. Mm. He wasn't uh, bitter. He just said, I, I have, this is the suffering I've received. He, he never complained. Mm. He just accepted it. He said, this is what, you know, God has in store for me. And I need to, uh, you know, embrace this. He really taught me how to suffer well mm. without complaining. And uh, to still be a man of love in suffering has a great capacity for us to increase our love for others. So we can read about suffering in books yeah. and hear about them in seminars but many times it's our own personal experience of going through suffering and how we handle it that's the best teacher but also the people that we love around us who are suffering that teach us how to suffer uh, well spouses uh, parents grandparents children when we see them suffer well it it impacts us deeply right so that grace is being shared in and through them for us and we're receiving that grace when we see them suffer with great love uh, for us. So it's our loved ones who suffer well and friends who suffer well that speaks deeply to us and impacts us uh, deeply. And it's transformative for us when we see them suffer well. So that for me personally, it was seeing my dad and the way that he suffered. That's extraordinary. I've never heard somebody describe it like that about seeing somebody else suffer well. Because like you said, it's 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 one thing when we have an abstract notion of it, we're reading a book about it, whatever. It's another when you see somebody walking or downward spiraling through the daily walk or the daily experience of suffering. Um, would you say when you think about and, and we could get into and we'll talk with, about this with Elijah, but when you think about the whole notion of of suffering and the age old question of why doesn't all loving God allow suffering, etc. I guess I guess one question I want to ask you among the many that surround suffering is when you are when you are considering your own formation surrounding the coping with suffering and in turn advising and counseling people in your parish who are going through suffering, what is the, what is the greatest wisdom you have drawn from and the greatest wisdom you've been able to pass on to people who are grappling with this raw experience that is suffering? 
You know, I think because of our human nature and the way we're put together like Lego pieces, um, you know, we oftentimes want to ask the question, why? Why did this happen? Why me? Why did God allow this? And so that question is kind of over, you know, it's looming in our lives, the question of why. And our Lord may give you some insight into the question of why you and why why you're going through that. He may or may not. That's that's up to him and his will and what he in the mystery of his providence. However, I, I find the question of how do you see God in this, or where is our Lord in this, or how has our Lord helped you in this, a much more um, life giving question mm. than the question of why, because the question of why probably is only going to be answered in the next life, right? When you yeah, see the whole yeah. book, right? We only see a couple pages or a couple slices of the pie right now. We don't see the whole pie. But it's a little easier to see how is God in this or how is God touching me through this or through the people that are trying to minister and love me in my suffering. So I find the question of how to be much more manageable mm. and uh, meaningful for us than the question of why, which is going to be ultimately mysterious for us. So I try to kind of help us to adjust and move our attention away from a question that's ultimately quite mysterious yeah. to one that's kind of right in front of our face that's a little easier to see in the people around us and how we're handling the suffering. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, I love John Paul's uh, little uh, take on suffering that we have to keep our eyes fixed on Christ mm. in his passion and his cross. And we keep gazing upon him in his suffering to find some meaning in our suffering, right? It unites us with him in his heart, his sacred heart, and it has so much redemptive value, as we know in our Catholic tradition, right? So I think the question of how, it, it brings a lot more peace to us than the question of why, which may or may not be answered in this life, but it will be answered in the next life. It's, uh, it's really well said. I mean, it's great advice. You know, it's interesting because when you think about um, the beginning of the Divine Comedy, you have, you know, Dante lost in the woods and and you know so fearful that that to i mean to to recount his experience would be it's almost better to die is what he says in the first uh canto and then obviously virgil guides him down through hell which is even worse than the fear he originally had but we come all the way around to to uh par the 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 book he has on paradise where he sees all all he sees you know the culmination of the cosmos and 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 the the beatific vision and 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 so on and he talks about all the all these disparate pages um, of of creation that seems broken and in fragments coming together like leaves in a book um, to 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 come to a fullness of greater understanding. Likewise, you have the suffering of the the priest in Diary of a Country Priest um, who goes through so much. It's just it's just anguish after anguish, and yet in the end, sorry, spoiler to those who haven't read it, but you should still read it. He's dying, and as he's dying, he's he's saying to his friend, "Grace is everywhere," and 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 I'll, and I'll tell you, Father, you know, when I'm teaching uh, medical students and residents, and we're talking more about kind of the narratives of patients and so on, we talk about suffering, but we talk about grace too. And and one of the things that I've come across is, oftentimes in patients' lives or in our own lives, the suffering can be so overwhelming that grace gets obliterated. It's it, it's it's obscured from our view, and 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 sort of like you've said, see it you know, look for it. Um, uh, uh, don't sleepwalk past the grace. And when you start paying attention, uh, it, it becomes readily apparent. And sometimes you get thunked across the head and you're not even looking and there it is in front of you. So I love the notion that, you know, leave the why to God and the, and the, and the, you know, when everything comes to full fruition and we're with him in heaven. Uh, but, but, but in the, in the midst of your suffering now grapple with the how, and but especially the grace that is to be found, uh, uh, embedded, if you will, uh, although somewhat obscured in the suffering uh, and go from there. Is, is that a fair characterization? Yeah, very fair. And let me just add one more point here. I think that's it's noteworthy is um, my first summer as a seminarian, I was getting used to visiting people who were really sick. And the and the priest said, uh, the pastor said, go visit, you know, uh, so-and-so. Her name was uh, Marie. And I, I went to go visit her at the hospital. And I walked in the hospital and she was in horrible shape. I mean, blotches of skin. There was tubes coming all over the place. Like that. And, and you have to try to have a poker face to not like kind of yeah. lose it when you're somebody that's suffering that that terribly. And I was my job was to bring her communion. And um, I sat down with her and I said, Marie, um, you know, I share how you're doing, how, how are things going? Uh, and she said, you know what? I'm, I'm hanging in there. Um, you know, 
if you wouldn't mind, would you like to share, would you share your story with me of how mm. you decided to become a priest? I cannot tell you what that did for me. I thought, here's this lady who is suffering horribly, horribly in this bed. And she wants to know about me wow. and my story and how God is working in my life. And I gave her uh, Holy Communion uh, uh, that day, and she died the next day. Wow. When I went to her funeral uh, with, obviously, the, the church was packed. My point in this story is that uh, as best as you can, by the grace of God, is to get out of yourself. Mm. And again, to try to focus on uh, other people and hearing their stories and what they're doing does help. It does help. She was masterful at getting out of herself and her suffering to know how I'm doing. And here I am. This was probably 15 years, 15 years ago. I still remember her. Wow. And I still remember that question. And I still remember how much charity she had and asking me how I'm doing. And I shared my story with her. She said, I'll pray for you. I'm so grateful you're going to be a priest. And this is a woman who gets it, who is really united to Jesus and still focused on other people. So as far as you can, uh, again, by the grace of God, to try to look beyond yourself and your own kind of pity party sometimes we get into, yeah. the needs of others, that helps relieve suffering and the burden as well. Right. Well said. Well said. Hi, I'm Todd Warner, Managing Editor of Evangelization and Culture, the journal of the Word on Fire Institute. Word on Fire is a global evangelical community that exists to provide our members with the resources they need to proclaim Christ to a secular culture. Our award-winning quarterly journal, Evangelization and Culture, is offered exclusively to Word on Fire Institute members. It's a tangible representation of our mission and goal to lead with beauty in order to bring others to the knowledge of truth. Inside each issue, you'll find writing from premier scholars and inspiring pieces on literature, culture, and daily life from fellow missionaries on the journey to know and serve Christ. Get a copy of the current issue of the Evangelization and Culture Journal for free by visiting wordonfire.org journal. Thank you, and join us in bringing Christ to a hungry culture. Segment three, what Elijah can teach us. In your essay, The Adventures of Elijah, for our spring issue of Evangelization and Culture, Father, you wrote, quote, Isolated and exhausted, the worn, worn out prophet lies by a broom tree. Elijah is, without question, a portrait of despair. He not only wants to resign his office as prophet, but says in exasperation, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Whereas Jonah asked to die after Nineveh's successful repentance, Elijah asked to die because of his perceived failure. So, Father, if you could, could you just tell us a little bit about Elijah, this prophet who seems deflated, and I guess with a particular attention to how are we to be inspired by a prophet who is, quote, the portrait of despair, end quote. Yeah, no great question. You know, one of the things I love about sacred scripture is the fact that it presents us with uh, these rich uh, biblical characters, uh, including not only their strengths uh, and the gifts that God has given to them, but also their gaps and their uh, flaws and weaknesses uh, as well. So in reading them, I think uh, we actually see ourselves in them, which comforts us uh, because we ourselves obviously are not perfect. And so in this great figure of Elijah, which is who is one of the greatest uh, um, prophets of the Old Testament, we see these moments of triumph uh, with, uh, you know, obviously his uh, a defeat of the 450 uh, prophets of Baal on uh, Mount Carmel. Uh, and, but then we also see these moments of great weakness where he runs in fear from uh, Queen Jezebel and moves into a, a space of isolation and discouragement and despair where he feels very alone and his perceived failure as well. So each of us uh, in our own lives, you know, with kind of the contours of grace, also have these moments of great triumph uh, where we feel... Uh, confident in the Lord and all that he's done in our life and we're grateful and these are moments of what we call consolation but we also have these moments of defeat and failure where we feel overwhelmed like Elijah did uh, as well and so we are discouraged and we feel isolated and alone and the uh, term that our St. Ignatius um, tradition uses is desolation that we feel and desolation where God feels far from us and we feel uh, in some sense like a failure or discouragement uh, and so when we read and see Elijah, we see ourselves in him, and uh, it comforts us to know that we're not alone uh, in both our good times and in our bad and our 
our moments of triumph and also our moments of failure as well. So there's something comforting about this particular prophet and other great figures like him where both their gifts and their gaps are on display. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And by the way, one thing you said, Father, that was so helpful was the notion of the stories that, that in, you know, that, that, you know, help us, that inspire us, that guide us. And it was, it was kind of similar also, not just the lives that, that were led in the biblical lives that were led in the saints and so on, but the stories that, that Christ told, you know, for instance, what I've oftentimes thought is, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. It's, it's, it's vital to say that, but when he tells the story of the good Samaritan, uh, uh it, it just enfleshes that, 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 that truth. And we are a storytelling and a story receiving, uh, people. And, and, one of the things that I have found also is we read great literature, we watch films, uh, yes, to escape, to enjoy, to relax, and so on. But we're also taking notes. I mean, quietly we're taking notes about, you know, what happens to this person? How do they get out of it? How do they solve this problem? Because there's a certain amount of community we want in the midst of our sufferings. And I, I appreciate you also talking about um, everybody experiences this thing, this desolation. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there that that feel like they are alone, they are isolated, and and others, you know, we have a, we have a world that that airbrushes everything and 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 tries to present, um, you know, the outer skin of a profoundly deep and oftentimes troubled but yet dignified humanity, and they think I'm the only one that has to go through this. And the, and as you said, and you've heard uh, an immense amount of suffering, I'm sure, in the uh, the hallowed uh, confessional itself, um, people who suffer, people who are in desolation, they are not alone. And it doesn't mean they're not alone just because the body of Christ surrounds them, the people, there are fellow sufferers with them. There's a God that loves them that will midwife them from uh, from that place of desolation to a place of grace. Is, is that a fair way of, of characterizing it? Oh, absolutely. And it, is, it makes me think of a story. Uh, our, my first sort of um, field experience in a hospital, and I'm going to visit a children's hospital in D.C. and the burn victims. And it's just, you know, horrible suffering, right? Some of this, these, these kids are going through and their families. And uh, my job was to walk from room to room and to visit them and to let them know uh, that God is with them. And I and our professor said, you know, gentlemen, you guys are new to wearing your collars. Mm. And they said, he said, what does that mean? And it turned into like a middle school classroom. You know, they started yelling out, and Jesus, love, God, you know, all this stuff. And he said, yeah, that's, that's fine. But he said, at the end of the day, uh, you're walking in there and you're letting them know that they're not alone. And you're letting them know that I'm a man who is in relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Blessed Virgin Mary, and you are not alone in your suffering. Mm. And if they don't have a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right, the triune God, you're inviting them to have that relationship to know that they're not alone. And if they have that relationship with the Lord, to just pray with them and to deepen that relationship and to acknowledge the presence that he's with them in their suffering. So I have never forgot that that he said the caller, it, it basically says that I'm a man in relationship, a man who's in, madly in love with God. Mm. And I'm here to invite you into that relationship if you don't already have one. And that you're not alone in your isolation, your discouragement, despair, and your suffering. But there is one who is much greater than you, uh, who is with you to give you the strength that you need to handle your suffering well and to bear it well with great love. Tremendous. Father, um, one thing I want to pick up on, uh, something else you've written uh, with us. Um, you had written, uh, when, time, when times get tough, be assured that the Lord will always provide for you, but you must remember. And my question for you is, what is it about us that makes us forget that truth so easily? Yeah, it's part of the fallen human condition, right, is our spiritual amnesia that we tend to forget. I mean, if you read over the Old Testament, uh, especially you look at Moses' farewell speech on Mount Nebo, mm. look at how many times he keeps saying over and over again, remember all the mighty deeds and what God has done for you. Wow. Remember the covenant. And the reader, reason go, what is wrong with these people? That he keeps saying this. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's kind of annoying, right? Like, you're like, how many times does he have to keep saying this? And then you think about your own life. You think, well, wait a second here. I'm not that much different. Yeah. I, I it too, right? Uh, and so uh, to remember uh, all that God has done for us, because what remembering does is it gives us strength in the present moment. And it gives us a sense of um, motivation that God will always be with us, right? It's when we forget that we feel like uh, spiritual orphans and we become discouraged and when we feel isolated and alone and it saps our energy, right? 
Uh, but when we remember the, the covenant, and for us as Catholics, it's the covenant in Christ, right? The, the blood poured out, you know, the body that's offered for you and for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that gives us hope and that gives us strength. And that says, okay, I can endure pretty much anything with in and through Christ. And I can have deep confidence in the one who was and the one who is and the one who will come, our Lord Jesus. So that remembering is very, very, very critical for us. And we tend to forget because of our fallen human condition. You know, Phil, it really does reinforce, you know, for those people who are naysayers about the Bible or the the, the truthfulness of of this faith and so on, it is really interesting because, like you said, that that's a really an interesting literary observation. Like, say a person who doesn't believe in God and they're just reading this and they're, they're like, well, why is Moses saying this over and over again? I, I mean, it, the fact that you have that included, you know, this person is saying this again and again and again, or I mean, how many times does do, do angels or does Jesus have to say, you know, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. And it speaks to, it speaks to the need that God has and the need that the, the, the need God has to tell us and the need we have to hear it, that it's, it's going to be okay. You are an anxious people. We are an anxious people. It's going to be okay. It's interesting. I think, I think in, in uh, the Christian anxiety, a book written by Hans Urs von Balthasar, I think the very opening lines speak to the notion that, um, Effectively, when it comes to fear and anxiety, when you read scripture, you come to realize that scripture has no fear of fear and anxiety because it, it just, un, uh, the, the word of God understands that we are, we are broken and, and, and yet dignified. We are, we are, we are, you know, hoping for and have been granted redemption. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we forget uh, and we worry and we limp and we're, in, and, and we go wayward and we're in need of reclamation and not not yes by our efforts to be reclaimed but mostly by surrendering to the the reclaiming efforts of a, of an all loving god yeah exactly right and to draw our attention uh, back to the uh, uh the figure of elijah there's a line in there it's really quite delightful um you know just before he calls on that fire upon that uh, sacrifice and he pours the water over it he has this great line he says you know how long will you go limping with two mm. different opinions and mm. that's the Translation, how long you would limp. So when your heart is divided and you're full of anxiety, you limp along in the spiritual life. And uh, the importance of having an undivided heart, right? The Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. And so that when one's heart isn't divided and one's heart is complete and whole and integrated and focused on our true prize of our Heavenly Father in Christ and with the Holy Spirit, we don't limp along. We can, mm. uh, all of our energy is, is pushed in one direction like a river, right? We're in Minnesota here. And so our, we're the, the, the source of the river, that river that goes down. Uh, but when our heart is divided and we're full of anxiety, we limp along. We limp along and we struggle. And our Lord doesn't want us to limp along, right? He wants us to not just even walk, but to run with him, yeah. right? Run yeah. with him. Well said. Well said. Gosh, uh, Father, I know how busy you are and I'd, I'd love to keep you on for that much longer. Um, but I, I, I know you have to go on and do other things. I want to ask you before we we step away, um, I know you're a voracious reader and I, I love getting the take, and I know our, our listeners do too, um, what are great readers reading? So what what reading are you engaged in right now? And also maybe say what you're reading right now, but also are there any works you would recommend to inspire or comfort those who are listening that are are in the midst of suffering? So a uh, book that I'm working my way through is actually George Weigel's uh, book on the Second Vatican Council. Mm. Um, I pretty much uh, get, try to get my hands on anything that he writes because he's just, he's wonderful, right? He's so well read and has a nice uh, vision uh, in terms of like where we've been and um, where we're, you know, heading, you know, moving forward. So uh, and the Second Vatican Council is just so rich, right? And all the, the theology there and the understanding of the church. So that's That's a great read. Uh, a second is, um, you know, believe it or not, I like to just the, the daily mass readings with commentaries and to pray with them because, you know, that daily nourishment of our bread of, of sacred scripture, mm. uh, which I love uh, so very much. And then there's also another little book uh, that I made my way through um, called From Christendom to Apostolic Mission as a little tiny book. Uh, that I know many priests are reading right now. It's a great little read in terms of like, there are certain times and eras in the church when uh, you know, the underpinnings of the culture has a Christian mentality and institutions have a Christian uh, focus and, and, and guided by Christ. Uh, that's been breaking apart the last 40 or 50 years here. 
And so we're now moving into much more missionary uh, uh, time. And what does that look like? How does the church shift her focus and, and shift the way she lives and, and spreads the gospel uh, amongst us? That's a fantastic uh, little read. I've worked my way through that. And then for me personally, you know, anything with uh, St. Therese, our patron saint, I love, uh, you know, Father Jacques Philippe's got some great mm. little books. We Have Trust and Love is a fantastic uh, little book. Of course, her story of a soul, I can never get tired of reading that one. Yeah. Uh, and any uh, books on the Martin family and the way they raise these children with such intentionality uh, of, of making them saints. Uh, I'm reading a little book on uh, the mom and the dad and how they uh, raise their children. This little book called The Extraordinary Parents of St. Therese, which is just wonderful uh, by Helene Mungin. Uh, which is great. So uh, a variety of different things, I guess you could say, uh, yeah. on my jacket. Wonderful. Father, could you say a word or two about the relics uh, that will be coming to visit uh, uh, St. Therese uh, in the not too distant future? Yeah, we're really excited about this. So grateful for the Archbishop um, Hebda uh, for writing a letter to the rector of the Basilica of, of, of St. Therese in Lazoo um, and asking for the relics to come here to the Archdiocese. Uh, he and I are grateful to work on that with him, and um, he said the, he said yes. Uh, the rector did. Uh, so the first time ever, the relics would be coming to the Archdiocese of, of St. Paul, Minneapolis, and uh, so they'd be going to uh, the Carmelite Monastery first in Lake Elmo. I was like, I can't pass them over. I'm going to be talking to them long enough. <laughs> uh, so we're going to let them get the relics for a couple of nights. Uh, then they'll go to the cathedral uh, for three, four days, then the basilica, mm. uh, and then here to St. Therese in Deep Haven. So they will be here from October 3rd of this year through the 16th. So they're going to kind of make their way through the archdiocese here. And if you know anything about the little flower, uh, when, wherever her relics go, people seem to come out of the woodwork uh, yes. to see her because she's always many, many miracles of healing come through her picking of flowers in heaven. Uh, mm -hmm. for us and the healing of families and the healing of faith and sometimes physical healings that happen. So truly grateful that those relics are coming here. They'll be here at our parish October 12th to the 16th. It'll be the biggest event uh, our parish has seen in 75 years of having our patron saint come home in some sense here to our parish. So grateful to God and grateful to the little flower to have her come here and our archbishop as well for writing the letter for us. Wonderful. Father, before we part, could we ask you for your blessing upon us at, uh, at Word on Fire in the ministry? We're trying to trying to carry out? Absolutely. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, all the angels, all the saints, including St. Tres and her beautiful family, may Almighty God bless you in all the work that you do, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Father Andre, a gifted priest in love with the Lord, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Oh, you're welcome. So I've been thinking, how do we wrap our heads around suffering? And I mean real, true, raw suffering. What can we say to that colleague diagnosed with an unexpected and terminal cancer? To the sibling ruined by an unfaithful spouse? To a friend devastated by a child lost to suicide? What can we say? Won't everything we say, everything we wish, all that we intend, find itself falling immeasurably short, even offensively trite, in the face of such awesome loss? Perhaps, but perhaps it isn't what we say, but just the fact that we are there, fumbling, uncertain, even impotent to do any damned useful thing, but present nonetheless, even in silence. When the young Leonard Andre, watching a baseball game with his ALS-afflicted father, asked how he was handling his diagnosis and his inevitable fate, his dad humbly admitted without complaint that he was open to God's grace. From Father Andre's perspective, his father unquestionably suffered, and in a way, suffered without question. But all the while, he opened the door to God and others. While his body withered, his faith grew. Father Andre's dad went outward and upward, not inward and downward. In the 38th chapter of Job, when the suffering man has concluded his questioning of the God of all creation, God answers Job out of a storm with a question himself. First, he challenges Job to humble himself. Who is this who darkens counsel with words of ignorance, the Lord thundered. Gird up your loins now like a man. I will question you, and you tell me the answers. And then he unfolds a creation story so vivid that it boggles the mind, defies explanation, and engenders an abject humility in the man who once shook his fist at God, a holy concession that the Lord knows what he is doing. 
If we trust in God's operation of the physical universe, we must have faith in his handling of the moral universe as well. In the Gospel of John, after Jesus applied clay made of dirt and spittle to the blind man's eyes and granting him sight, a fierce debate arose as to the origin of the man's suffering. Why did he suffer? Was it his sin? Was it his parents' sin? And how could this unknown prophet bring him sight? The cosmic order, or at least mankind's comfortable construct explaining it, was thrown into turmoil. But when the disciples approached Christ about the question, he simply explained, Neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so that the works of God might be made visible through him. Later in the same gospel, when Jesus arrived, an inexplicable two days after being summoned to heal his friend Lazarus, two days when precious time was lost, two days when sister and friends tied themselves in knots over the beloved life slipping away before their very eyes, two days of suffering over what might have been, Martha ran out to meet him, and you can almost see her furrowed brow, her tear streaming eyes, even her hands pressing hard against the chest of Christ, imploring, why, Lord, why? Mary, too, met him and mourned, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus, he wept. His first response was to grieve with them. God cried for their loss and for his loss. And then he told them, to take away the stone. Looking back on the miracle of Lazarus's resurrection, the disciples recalled their master saying, this illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. How do we wrap our heads around suffering? I'm still not sure, but I know that having faith in a God who loves us and will never abandon us is a fairly good start. Now, before we part ways, I'd love to recommend a book. And the book I'm recommending was recommended to me by Father Andre. It's the famous spiritual classic, uh, St. Therese of Lisieux's Story of a Soul. It's a spiritual autobiography that represents the life and the spiritual inside story of the little flower. I'd recommend it to anybody. It's, It's so personal, it's so intimate, and it's so approachable that it will do wonders in terms of deepening your relationship with Christ. So between now and our next visit, I hope you crack open Story of a Soul from St. Therese of Lisieux. Thank you for listening to the Evangelization and Culture Podcast. Please be sure to subscribe to Word on Fire's YouTube channel, leave a review, and share with your friends. And don't forget to get a free copy of Word on Fire's award-winning journal, Evangelization and Culture, at wordonfire.org journal. Until next time, I'm Todd Warner. Please keep proclaiming Christ to a hungry culture.